All right, so um, as Jeff mentioned, I'm Beth Biller from the University of Edinburgh. I'm going to talk to you about direct imaging today. Anyone, who's ready to see some pictures of planets? Yay! Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> We've got about 20 of them now. Um, and I say, or nearly planets, because uh, there's some arguments about some of these. Um, these are all infrared images of young planets. There's only one of these images that isn't infrared. Anyone know which one it is? I heard it, I heard it, who said it? Fomalat, yes. This is optical. It's also very controversial. Um, so why do we want to do this, right? Why do we want to take pictures of planets? Well, the obvious answer is they're pictures. The planets are really obvious here, right? There's a planet, here's four, all in the same system. And that means we have photons directly from the planets themselves, which means that we can really start characterizing them in much greater detail, especially their atmospheres. Uh, we can do spectroscopy of these, and this is very complementary to, say, for instance, transit spectroscopy. Uh, but while most methods of transit spectroscopy right now are kind of skimming the surface of the atmospheres, direct imaging, you're looking right down. So it's a bit more favorable in terms of looking for uh, absorption features and for instance GJ 1214 if it was a directly imaged planet we'd probably have a better idea what's going on with this atmosphere but that's actually a bit of a different talk um, today I'm going to talk about demographics and what's important with direct imaging in terms of planet demographics is one if you want to know what's going on outside of 10 AU this is the way to go all of these planets are more than 10 AU from their star unlike other techniques that closer in you're more likely to detect a planet Direct imaging is exactly the opposite. The other is, these are young systems. So some of these are actually in the process of forming or have just formed. So they are important for connecting back to planet formation uh, methods. All right, so I always like putting up kind of frame questions um, in the beginning of talks. Uh, so usually when I think about comparative exoplanetology or what we can study about planets, I usually divide it into physical properties of individual planets. Uh, masses or atmospheric properties or orbits and architecture. So today we're going to be talking a lot more about architecture and what we can learn from direct imaging in terms of the architecture of planetary systems. And again, to drive the point home even more, uh, you've seen not exactly this plot but many different variations on pretty much the same thing. All of these different techniques are sensitive to different sorts of planets. So RV in transit, okay, this laser pointer doesn't work. Generally closer in, um, as we heard, uh, lensing is particularly interesting because you can get smaller planets a bit further out, but again, outside of 10 AU, direct imaging is the only game in town. And granted, right now with direct imaging, we're looking at high mass planets at these separations, but these are going to be important in terms of what sort of system architectures you get in general. All right, so now that we've established that we're interested in finding these, how do we do so? As you can easily see here, uh, lots and lots of RV and transit and lensing detections, not so many direct imaging detections. Why is that? It's a technically difficult thing to do. So I'm going to step through how we open up parameter space for exoplanet imaging. Uh, the first and obvious issue we have to overcome is that stars are very, very bright and planets are very, very faint. Uh, so we're talking about a factor of 10 to the ninth if we're trying to look for something like Jupiter around the sun. So that's why uh, one of the un often, unfortunately, unspoken assumptions with exoplanet imaging is that we look at young stars. And the point of this is a young planet is going to be brighter than an older planet, and enough so that you get a much more favorable contrast ratio. So this is a classic plot from Burroughs et al. 2001, just looking at age versus luminosity. Um, here are some nice low mass stars, and you can see they very conveniently go onto the main sequence, and they same, stay about the same luminosity for quite a long time. Whereas your brown dwarfs here in green, and your planets, uh, start out hot, start out a bit puffier in these models, and <coughs> just cool off and contract over time. So if you can look at them, earlier on, you're going to do better. Uh, so this actually very much limits the number of stars that we can observe 
with direct imaging, unlike transit or RV, where if you have a bright enough star, it's going to work well. Uh, we are really focused on, well, actually not the very youngest stars, because they happen to be a bit too far away to resolve planets. Uh, but we look at generally stars that are members of what are known as young moving groups. So these are nearby associations, about you know, 100 million to 300 million years old. And um, star formation has ceased, but these associations are still moving in about the same direction. And so if you find a star that has that sort of kinematic motion, you know it's most likely young. And if you found an, find an object on it, also since we don't measure masses for these objects, we estimate them, you can estimate that it has probably a relatively young age. But this is, of course, model dependent. So these are what we refer to as hot start models. Uh, there are also cold start models. And we've heard about a little bit about this from some other speakers. Hot start models are what you get if you start at essentially an arbitrarily high entropy state. Like you'd expect if you had a star forming in um, just a cloud. Cold start models uh, are more like what you'd expect uh, in the core accretion case, where you have gas accreting onto a solid core. And in both cases, you're still doing better at younger ages compared to older ages. But it's a question of how much better you're doing. Obviously, for hot start models, a lot better. For cold start models, not quite as much. Um, but still, either way, focusing on younger stars helps us um, not have to overcome quite as big of a contrast ratio compared to older stars. So that's step one. Step two, which is actually a bunch of different steps, uh, is overcoming the technological hurdles to reach the contrast necessary to image young planets. So if we're, instead of 10 to the ninth contrast that you would need if you wanted to image Jupiter around the sun, we're talking more like 10 to the fourth to 10 to the seven times fainter. Uh, and the big limiting factor, it, it, when people initially thought about this, the big limiting factor in doing so is essentially the atmosphere. If you have an eight meter class telescope and you want to look at something within the inner arc second and you have the native resolution of that telescope and you have an infinitely tight PSF, then you should be able to do so. That shouldn't be a difficulty. Uh, unfortunately, we have all this air, which is busy scattering light around and making it rather more difficult to do so. So there's two methods for overcoming this. Uh, you can use a telescope in space and skip the atmosphere entirely. Or from the ground, you can use adaptive optics. And I won't go into any detail at all about how adaptive optics <laughs> works. Um, one way of thinking about it is it's a method where you take all your light that is scattered around in your seeing limited halo that is swamping out all those faint companions you'd like to find, and you stick it right back into the core of the point spread function. Um, now, there's actually whole summer schools about how exactly you do this, but for now, it happens, and it works really well. <laughs> <laughs> actually, in, with the newest plant finder, it works really, really, really quite well. Um, so this is a Strel ratio of 1%, um, which is in the seeing limited case, and this is a Strel ratio of 14%. Strel is basically just how well you can correct. A perfect image has a Strel of 100%. Current planet finding imagers, which I'll talk about more in about 20 minutes, are getting to strels of above 90%. But once you've done that, you've taken all the scattered light, stuffed it back in the core of the PSF, if there happens to be a faint companion that was lurking in that seeing limited halo, it can then pop out. So that's step one. Step two is then you can also use a chronograph. So this is one particular chronograph architecture. This is a Leo chronograph, there are many. There are also whole summer schools and whole conferences devoted to arguing about which architecture is best. Uh, but most of them have a simple part and a complicated part. So the simple part is here in this first focal plane. You have your occulting spot, right? So it's really simple. You want to look at a faint thing next to a bright thing, let's just block out the light from the bright thing. That's it. The complicated part is here in this next pupil plane where you have this Leo stop. And what it does, again, in no detail at all, is essentially clean up the diffraction pattern of your telescope. Removes the airy rings, essentially. 
And combining this, you can remove up to 99% of the incoming scattered starlight. OK, so that means contrast isn't too much of a problem. We do have the technology to reach the contrast we need. Unfortunately, then there is problem number two, which is speckle noise. And yeah, if you work in this field, you spend a lot of time thinking about speckles. You also spend a lot of time swearing at speckles. <laughs> um, so what you're looking at here, this is two minutes of data taken with the NACO AO camera at the VLT. I've smoothed it and subtracted it from itself to remove most of the smooth stellar halo. And once I've done that, you see all these lovely speckles. They do a really great job of mimicking planets. And essentially, they're just little images of the star that haven't been corrected by the AO system, just little reflections in the instrument. And the problem is they don't stay put. Uh, instead of, if I took another image two minutes later, it would look slightly different, this pattern. And if you played a movie of this, it would just kind of wobble around in a really annoying manner, uh, which means that unlike for photon-limited data, where you can just integrate longer and get a better signal to noise, this just blurs out and gives you a limiting speckle noise floor. So this is the next thing you need to overcome. And usually you need to use an instrumental method to do so. And again, there's many different methods, but I'll show you the one that's pretty much the industry standard right now. So this is angular differential imaging. This will be a movie in just a second. Um, you can, this is a dual band camera. Feel free to look at either side. They're completely the same. So what you do is you find a way to decorrelate real objects from the speckles. Uh, so for instance, let's say you, you want to turn, just turn the rotator off. Um, here's my useful prop. And let's say that you were looking at, say, a nice edge-on circumstellar disk. Now, as you observe that, over the course of its rising and setting, you would see that disk rotate on the sky with the parallactic angle. Yeah? And you can see that happening in this series of images where we have, in this case, a background star rotating on the sky with the parallactic angle over this observation. Let me play that again. Um, and you can see closer in the star and the speckle. And again, I've smoothed the image and subtracted it from itself, so most of the starlight's gone. But the speckles, you can see them just kind of, maybe you can see them? No. <laughs> There we go. You can see them just kind of wobbling about, whereas that real object moves in a very different way. So this is a way of decorrelating real objects from speckles. So, OK, this background star is obvious. But if it was closer in, that might be the only way you would detect it, in that it was moving differently than the speckles. Uh, so the most basic thing you can do is just derotate and stack. And that will already remove a lot of the speckle noise. But what's even more powerful is that if you just take, for every frame in your sequence, you take all the other frames, you can build an ideal point spread function and subtract it from your frame and remove a lot more speckle noise this way. Um, many people have different ideas of what ideal is, and this is another thing that people argue about a lot at conferences. Uh, so those are the basic elements you need to put together to image exoplanets. And just to put them all in one summary slide, uh, you need adaptive optics, or you need to work from space uh, to get the contrast necessary and, and resolution, because you need to get close to the diffraction limits to do this. Um, then you need to be using a coronagraph to boost your dynamic range even further. And on top of it, you're going to need to use some sort of speckle suppression technique uh, to really remove those speckles. So over the last decade and a half, there have been, I guess, about four generations, well, three generations and one genera generation four is starting now of surveys um, that combine, some of them use one, some of them use two, some of them use all three techniques. So I just wanted to step through what surveys have been done and what they were doing. The first started essentially in the late 90s and early aughts, and we're basically just using adaptive optics, which was all shiny and new at the time, and HST to try to get better contrast. So this is a ground a contrast curve from a ground-based survey with NACO at the VLT. And you'll see a lot of contrast curves. This one's plotted differently than every other one in this talk. So we just have separation versus delta magnitude, uh, how faint an object you could detect around the star. Usually we'll flip it. But here you see in the survey at one arc second, you're getting a delta magnitude about 0.5. 
12, at 0.5, at about 8. Of course, we're much more interested in this inner arc second than further out, because um, that's where we really expect the planets to live. So this first generation, again, were mostly just straight adaptive optics, or HST. They had quite small sample sizes of less than 50 stars. Uh, the samples weren't always the best selected either, because this was, again, very early days. Typical contrasts of about eight magnitudes at 0.5 arc seconds. And I've just given, hopefully, a reason, reasonable accounting of the ones that got completed. I apologize if I have left off anyone's favorite survey. So that was generation one. Generation two, I'm not sure what that is, uh, <laughs> added in uh, speckle suppression techniques. And in general, we're done on always on eight meter class telescopes. Um, larger samples, about 50 to 100 stars in these, and typical magnitudes were about 10 at 0.5 arc seconds. Um, so uh, VLT ones, this one, for instance, we were using a technique called SDI, spectral differential imaging, another sort of differential imaging technique. Um, this survey, the Gemini Deep Planet Survey, uh, was the first big survey done with ADI. All right, and as I probably should point out, um, generation one and generation two didn't really come up with any planets. Okay, generation three, or just keep on combining techniques. Um, large telescope, plus AO, plus coronagraph, plus speckle suppression techniques. So this is even starting to get into the era of custom-built planet-finding cameras. Much larger sample sizes, 100 to 300 stars, and getting contrasts of delta magnitude 12 or 13 at 0.5 arc seconds. So these are the most recent generation that are finishing up now or finished up in the last couple of years. So I'm not going to talk about all of these in detail because they only gave me 40 minutes to talk today. Uh, but these range from uh, the Nikki, you'll hear about this one in some detail. The Nikki Science Campaign, about 230 stars observed with Nikki, the near-infrared chronographic imager, Gemini South. Um, the NACO Large Program, this was about 150 stars with NACO at the VLT. IDPS, the International Deep Planet Survey with Keck and Gemini. This yielded one of the first detections. This is the survey that the HR 8799 planets came out of. Seeds at Subaru using Hai Chao, which has also yielded uh, one and maybe two planets, depending on how you want to define planet. Palms, which is a survey looking at lower mass M stars at Keck. And Leech, which is, the rest of these are all pretty much near infrared surveys. This is a mid infrared survey at the LBT, which is ongoing. All right, so back to these framing questions. Today I'm going to tell you about how big surveys of this type, can what they can tell us about the architecture of these systems. And I will use an example case to do so. Not surprisingly, the one that I was most involved with. So this is the Gemini Nikki planet finding campaign. Uh, this is a survey that was conducted from 2008 to 2012 with Nikki at um, Gemini. So about 230 stars in total, and this was the first survey done with a custom-built planet finder. So Nikki um, combined coronography and combined a high-order AO system, um, also with two different speckle suppression techniques. And here are a lot more contrast curves for you to look at. So what we expect to be able to detect is a function of star-planet contrast. So at one arc second, these are just a bunch of representative stars drawn from the survey just to give you an idea of the range of contrasts that we achieved. So at one arc second, we were getting a star planet contrast of about 10 to the fifth. Uh, median contrast this is, it, it varied some. And this was another survey that didn't detect any planets. But uh, the planets you detect and what you learn about them, or the brown dwarfs you detect in this case, um, are only half of the yield of a survey like this. The other half is what you can learn from these contrast curves and what you can rule out. Uh, so we can take contrast in terms of just simply what we can measure and convert it to mass. Well, not exactly mass, um, estimated mass. So what we're doing is taking that contrast curve, that's thing number one. We know the distance to the star, 
we have hopefully a good estimate of the age of the star. We know how bright the star is. And then we need to take a model, an of, of evolutionary model of the planet, and use that to convert our contrast. First we convert that to the um, apparent magnitude of the planet, then the absolute, and just convert to what mass that would correspond to. Again, this is model dependent. But using what is essentially a very standard con model, what we saw is for um, this particular sample from the Nikki campaign, this is actually, these are 78 stars from these nearby young moving groups. So these are the stars from the campaign that have the best measured um, distances and ages, in fact. And you just divide them up by spectral type. At 0.5 arc seconds, uh, we have sensitivity to high mass planets, 5 to 10 Jupiter mass planets. Out at 4 arc seconds, we even get sensitivity down to one Jupiter mass planets. So if the planets were there, we should have seen them. So what this tells us is that these wide planets must be comparatively rare. Then the next step, this is where we get into the statistics, is going from this kind of minimum detectable mass plot to actually putting a statistical limit on this. All right. And this is one of those plots that looks really simple, but it actually took a fairly complicated route to get to. So this is um, combining all the contrast curves for these 78 stars, com converting them to a minimum detectable mass, taking the actual yield from this particular survey, which was zero planets, and then using a Bayesian code to integrate over a variety of different planet distributions and then tell us what values of planet fraction are more and less probable. So this is just probability. These are more probable values, less probable values here. Planet fraction here is the average number of planets per survey star. And what you can see, these are two different models. This is a dusty atmosphere model and a condensed atmosphere model. Um, this one is a bit more optimistic about how bright planets will be. But in either case, we expect planet fraction to be low, as you'd expect in this case where we looked at 78 stars and didn't find any planets. We can marginalize under that curve and get a number. So the upper limit from this particular subsample was that we expect 8% or less to host planets of 1 to 20 Jupiter masses at some major axes of 10 to 150 AU at the 95% confidence level. So wide planets are rare. Uh, so this is actually a really exciting time in direct imaging. Anyone know why? Do we have direct imaging people here? What came online in the last year? Sphere. Sphere. Yeah, exactly. Not just Sphere, GPI, Project 1640 at Palomar, and Skexeo. So these are all custom-built exoplanet imagers. Uh, they have very high-order high AO systems. They get excellent strels, have very good chronographs. And most of these also have integral field spectrographs. Um, which allow us to also immediately get a spectra for any candidate planet that you find. So I think the next year or two is going to be particularly transformative for this year, for this field. And you can already just see this in, if you compare old versus new images. So um, these are not sphere GPI images. Uh, this is a Nikki image of uh, the debris disk HR 4796. And you see it's this very beautiful ring. But eventually, as you get close enough in your space, it becomes a speckly mess. And this is Beta Pic B. This is an 8 to 10 Jupiter mass planet around a higher mass star. This is the NACO discovery image uh, from 2003. So this is the previous generation. And this is what these look like with GPI and Sphere. Yeah. <laughs> it's a notable difference, right? So you can see really close in with this HR 4796 disk. Now, beta pic doesn't look all that much better, but the key difference here is that old image I showed you, that's, you know, an hour or two on the sky. This is like 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's a really exciting time. So both GPI and Sphere are, going, are doing surveys right now. So GPI is the GPI Exoplanet Survey, or GPIs. Um, I'm involved with Sphere, so guess which one you're going to hear more about. <laughs> uh, Sphere, it's near Sir which is not an acronym. It means near infrared survey. So invariably, I always say near SUR survey, which is completely redundant. 
because that's the near infrared survey survey. Anyhow, sorry. <laughs> so this started in February 2015. We're going to be observing about 400 stars, but essentially these, this is generation four, and again, it's going to really probably blow away what we did with the generation three. So in advance, we've been simulating surveys with near sur So here's an example of results from a simulated survey. So this is for this particular simulated survey, which was done, um, it's a Monte Carlo simulation. Um, here's just the planet mass distribution, the eccentricity, some major axis, and stellar mass of the host. Again, for this simulated survey, where essentially what we're doing is we're just simulating an ensemble of stars around a possible um, survey sample, then comparing with the actual contrasts and seeing what we can detect. So how do we do this? Let's start with the ensemble of planets that we're simulating in this particular case. And what most people in direct imaging have done over the last um, decade or so is just start from the radial velocity distributions. So th these are the power law distributions on um, mass and semi-major axis from coming at all 2008. So these are fits to radial velocity um, planets. And so what we've been doing, which is not quite right, but you go with what you know um, for direct imaging, is we just extend that out, out to some cutoff. We've said, OK, you're only going to get planets as far as you have a disk. So you just extend your distribution and say, our, we cut off at, say, 40 AU, and that's as large as the disk we would expect for these objects. All right. So we also have to deal with normalization, getting the right number of planets around the star, given the actual stars, given the actual planet fraction measured. And we also, in this case, normalized to the known RV planets. Um, in this case, we use Fisher and Valenti to do so. Um, did this for the range of stellar masses. Um, the separations of the planets in this uh, sample were 0.3 to 2.5, but we extrapolated out to about 100 AU. Um, I'm going to talk about how we can possibly do this a little better in just a little while. Uh, but anyway, this is the, sim the population of planets we simulated. Then we need to choose a sample to put that population around. So here is just a representative sample. And this is the one we'll use for today. Uh, so these are young moving group stars, mostly, ages of less than 200 a million years. Oh, sorry, that's the age. And within 200 parsecs or so. So we put all those simulated planets around these real stars um, and then see, given the mass of those planets, translate back to luminosity with an evolutionary model. And then given our contrast curve, look at what we could detect and what we couldn't detect. Um, the one last ingredient is we also scaled by stellar mass, since there's been some results that higher mass stars should have more planets. So we did this in some cases and not in others. So for this simulated survey, depending on how far you want to cut off your distribution from 20 to 50 AU, um, we expect to find 17 to 70 planets. Uh, we already know that planets are pretty rare at 40 and 50 AU, so we really consider this to be the more reasonable prediction. So we expect to detect somewhere between, say, 10 and 30 new planets um, using Sphere. And probably there'll be some overlap with GPI. Um, at any rate, this means that we're going to be probably at least doubling the number of planets um, detected via direct imaging. So I wanted to talk about how we might be able to do this better. Again, this is making assumptions. And there's been a lot of surveys that have done this game, started with these radial velocity power laws, and made predictions of how, how many planets you expect to detect. And then found and said, oh, we're going to find four planets. And that's di more than zero. Well, mostly, because if you use Poisson statistics, it's not that much more than zero, but anyhow. Um, and then detect zero planets. So how do we do this a little better? One thing that I think is really exciting, and we heard a lot yesterday about population synthesis. So this is another way to get a batch of planets that you can put around your real stars. So we're doing this right now, making predictions with Sphere. And in this case, we're not actually uh, predicting how many planets. We're actually predicting how well we can rule out a given population. So I think Caitlin introduced this population yesterday. This is a disk instability 
uh, population synthesis by um, Forgan and Rice. So this is just we'll just look at this side. This is the end result. These colorful objects are the cores that survived the process of population synthesis. Um, they had fragmentation, migration, tidal downsizing, and the size is, um, gives you an idea of the mass. And then um, Duncan and Ken plugged those objects into an n-body simulator. So we, these systems each had about had two to five cores in them. And then they ran them through an n-body simulator for an additional million years to see what survived that process. So blue gives you the semi-major axis distribution of our population of objects that we're going to plug in and see what we can detect. And here is the object mass. And what's immediately notable is that we have some pretty high mass objects, 50 Jupiter masses, and quite a few um, lower mass objects too. So what have we already learned about wide companions to young stars? They're rare. So this puts a lot of wide compa companions in, this particular population. So what we really are trying to do here is see how well we can rule it out. So we do an ensemble of simulated surveys um, with a different, different numbers of um, percentage of stars that host planetary systems. So if we get one percent of stars host planetary systems, we expect to detect two or three planets. If two and a half do, we expect eight to 10. If 10 if I do, we expect 50 planets, right? So this is where we start looking at likelihood. So you guys are going to do this today, I think, in your hands-on session. You're going to use the Kolmogorov Smirnoff test. We're, we just used Poisson statistics. Um, so here is a simulated near sur survey. Um, five planet detections in this particular case. And what we can do, plugging into all this machinery, is we know that um, the planet, the um, percentage Fraction needs to be less than about 10% in this particular simulated case. All right, I think since I'm over, I am just going to pop up my conclusion slide and not talk through it and just answer any questions you might have. <laughs> All right, the question was, uh, how large is the sphere survey sample? that we expect to detect on order a couple dozen star planets from. And it's about 400 stars. So this is a higher yield that we expect from Sphere compared to earlier surveys. So earlier surveys, a rule of thumb is you need to look at about 100 stars before you're going to actually find something. Let's see if I can find which one. The mass sensitivity, where you have like the. Oh, I think I know which one. Okay. Going to get there eventually. <laughs> this one. Yes. So why can you detect um, lower mass objects around A stars? This this particular one in particular, and probably yes. because okay, probably because these are younger stars. Um, so the really tricky thing with direct imaging is we are estimating masses. So whatever age you put on your star is going to affect the mass that you estimate from your planet. And uh, A stars, on average, even, even though these are younger M stars, these A stars have to be young if they're even there. So that's probably why. Okay, so now more. Uh, Christoph then. You can, uh, but they're not as nice looking, so it's easier to just put the hot star ones up. I would say, I mean, when for wide objects, I would say that the cold starts, you still can put co good constraints on it. I think the survey that's going to really put the nail in that coffin is probably the leech survey. This is the one that's being done in the mid-infrared, um, and that means you actually can look at older stars, so you have less of this issue of uh, the difference between brightness for a warm star and cold star model. And I suspect those statistical results from that are going to essentially say, even for cold star models, these wide planets are rare. Yeah, so you were saying that for the, moment, like, the pre previous surveys, you don't have any overlap 
direct imaging and the mm -hmm. Would it be the case with uh, Sphere and G pi? Yes and no. In separation space, yes. Maybe, and maybe, maybe, maybe for the very closest radial velocity planets, we might actually barely image one. But the big issue is that the radial velocity stars are generally older. So we can look at young stars and get, get into similar separations probably with these next generation of objects, of in instruments, but they're not going to be the same. And then you have to look at things like the fact that since these are younger, you might not expect the same planet population because these are the ages of, say, the late heavy bombardment in our own solar system where things are moving around a lot. And you may simply have a different distribution compared to radial velocity planets. Ah. Okay, so by the time we're doing this, oh goodness, I haven't been repeating. Okay, so the, the question was, when we're doing the statistics, are we concerned about false positives possibly affecting the statistics? Um, so generally, we hope not. Like at the point we're doing statistics, if we have any detections, um, we really have tried to vet them really well. And so what you do generally is um, if you find a faint blob next to your bright blob, <laughs> you can't then just say, look, we found a nice companion. You have to wait and confirm that it's common proper motion um, with the star. Uh, now, for this next generation of surveys, you can do spectroscopy immediately. So if you find something, a faint thing that happens to have a T-dwarf spectrum next to your bright star, yeah, it's probably not a background object. Um, so I would say, in general, false positives are probably not so much of a problem. False negatives may be a bigger problem. <laughs>